Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking about the wonderful movie Bones and All. We are joined today by screenwriter David Kajanik. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the adaptation process, because this isn't the first time that you have adapted from a book, and in particular adapted from a book where the author is available to you as a resource during the process. Um, and there's something that you've said about how when you do those types of adaptations, you love to sit down with the author and really find out what it is that they're excited by with the adaptation, what it is that feels important to them to maintain in the adaptation. And so from the conversations that you had with Camille, I was very interested in what were some of the aspects that came out of that, because it is it is very different to the book, but also carries the essence of it in so many ways. And there are details that, that are interspersed. And I was interested in kind of what carried over from those conversations and how that helped you to determine how you were going to approach this project. Sure. I mean, about maybe 10% of the impulse to do that is about just simply reassuring the person that they're in, in good hands, meaning that I, that I, I want to be respectful of the, of the text. Uh, I want to be respectful of their point of view, that I'm a hard worker, you know, all those things that you can accomplish by a really good initial conversation. But really, the bulk of the reason to do that is because they are such different mediums and that may or may not be apparent to a, a writer of a book, fiction or, or nonfiction, um, that of telling, retelling their story or adapting it or translating it, if you will, into a visual medium is absolutely going to demand that changes be made. And, and so, you know, th that conversation is a really interesting one because usually you're, what you're asking an author to do is think about his or her own or their own work in a way that they hadn't before, or if they had, they've done it in a kind of uh, a fun way, like, ooh, if this were ever adapted into a film, but not in a kind of a serious scene by scene or character by character, more rigorous way. And so, you know, what I like to do is have one or two really long conversations about that at the beginning and then gain their trust enough to be able to just go away and, and, and write the script without them feeling like they have to be a part of that process. Um, because I go in the, in, pretty far into the weeds, you know, before I know exactly how I want to do the adaptation. With Camille in particular, you know, one thing we talked about early on is that I, I didn't think that I could translate the, 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 the tone of the book, which is a kind of, um, I don't want to call it a YA tone, because I, I don't really understand what people mean when they say YA. It feels like a, a needless category of, of literature. But in this particular case, the subject matter, the more um, disturbing elements of the subject matter were handled in a, with a kind of fairy tale tone, which I completely understand why in a book you would do that. It's really hard to do that when you're pointing a camera, <laughs> you know, at, at someone taking a bite out of someone else uh, or whatever else that, you know, we wanted to be, have more visual disclosure about. And so, you know, we talked a lot about what that might mean to the story. Uh, to treat the story visually in a more naturalistic way and really try to understand what a life like this would be like in the details, in the, in the, in the logistics. Um, and then the other thing I wanted her to know was that I might be able to be more explicit about things that she thought hadn't been explicit enough in the book. And one of those was, was in fact that she had a very specific uh, vegan subtext for the book, which isn't necessarily one I considered on my first read. But once I understood that was really important to her, that there be some connection between the idea that, you know, these eaters are destroying lives and they're recognizably human to us because they're eating humans, uh, that, that that sentiment could carry over. And that for people who, you know, eat meat without really thinking about the fact that they are in fact eating creatures who didn't ask to be killed. They've been murdered if you follow a certain line of thinking. And, and I wanted there to be, a, you know, earned parallels in the in, in the film uh, about that because I think she thought she'd maybe been a bit polite in the book and wanted to be just a bit more <laughs> sort of, uh, um, I don't know, a bit louder about it in the film. And so I tried to accommodate that. That's so interesting. And, and as part of your research as well, it sounds like there were different strands. I've, I've heard you mention that you did some research and read a lot about body dysmorphia, um, you know, but also that you talked to a lot of women in your life about that particular age, because it is also very much a coming of age story about a young woman at the same time that it seeps into genre. Um, and so what were the different strands and threads of research and elements that that really helped you as you were developing characters and developing story? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a big difference between 
being a kind of tourist into these subjects and really building empathy. And so, you know, when I decided that when I was comfortable enough um, to take on the project, and that meant really getting the permission of the author that a man write this adaptation, because it is, it is quite a sincere and, 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 and pretty, um, you know, it's a difficult time in this character's life that's being charted out. I mean, she begins the story as a, as a girl and she ends it as a woman. And, and so I thought, well, I, I have the best tool anybody could have to be able to step out of my own experience. And I had a sort of a, a gay experience of the, of adolescence and that has some crossover, but it doesn't necessarily mean I should project those dynamics onto this story that I have the tool of, of being of wonderful friendships with many women that I could listen. I could ask and, and ask these questions and, and know that I would get very you know, heartfelt and specific and accurate kind of answers that, that wouldn't be um, polite. And so spent a lot of time talking about specific scenes, specific dynamics in the book. It's one of the reasons I changed the gender uh, of the parents uh, in the novel. She's left by her mother and, and seeks out her father in, in the film, it's the reverse, uh, partly because of a couple of conversations I had about with friends of mine who were willing to tell me about how difficult it was to not have the guidance of a woman in their lives when they were growing up. Because of course, you know, as a man, you know, we can understand something intellectually about what a female body goes through in these adolescent years and the particular anxieties and fears and surprises and sometimes really jarring surprises that can lead to in a young woman's life. But that's nothing like a woman who's gone actually physically gone through all of those things to be able to sort of take a young girl's hand or a young woman's hand and, and, and walk them through it with empathy and a lack of judgment. And, and so things like that are, are what changed my understanding of how I could rig the characters and their dynamics in the books to try to, to more understand how, how abandoning it would feel um, for a young woman to, to, to never have had the voice of a mother in her head guiding her through these, these, these terrible times. I mean, terrible in <laughs> the way they're presented in this particular book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's, there's also a, a lot of aspects in terms of telling a story like this, where you're doing a lot of world build, building for the audience. So when was the first time that Marin experienced this, you know, even the detail of she didn't remember it for a long time. So she would have these actions that she was participating in, but she had no memory or recollection of it. So when was the first time she remembered, um, you know, how often does she need to feed all of these things that go into building the world for the audience and the story. And yet the the film is very delicate with language and allows itself to have a lot of those moments where less is more, you know, and so even little inklings early on where, oh, she hasn't allowed her photograph to be taken for the yearbook, that was intentional. And then yeah. you kind of realize as you piece together other pieces. So how did you always find the ways that there were these little character details and these quieter ways to build the world rather than having an expositional scene, for example, where she's talking to, you know, she's talking to Lee and, and they're kind of just exchanging and going back and forth on like, oh yeah, that happened to me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, dialogue, I, I think I share this sentiment with a lot of, certainly a lot of directors and, and, and probably some writers too, is I would prefer to do as much of the work of, a sto of telling a story visually, silently, if possible. I mean, a lot of directors I know would really, really wish we were still in the silent era <laughs> so they could be making fully silent films. And I understand that completely. It's a visual medium. So for me, uh, the, only, uh, the only way I really understand how dialogue can work in that kind of um, hierarchy is that it's naturalistic, um, that it's not built as a delivery system for the audience. I really um, have, have developed quite an allergy to lines of dialogue that are just meant to explain to you a rule or a feeling that a character's having. And, you know, I, I, want, I want the dialogue and I want you know, the, the experience of watching the film to be more observational than that. And so to me, mild confusion is not the enemy. Perfect understanding in a way is the enemy because through, it's through ambiguity that we are active in an audience. We are trying to understand the difference between what a character might have said in one moment and how he or she or they might be behaving in another moment, that those aren't contradictions to the character. And so we must work to find a, re, a way to understand them in harmony. And so you know, some of the, the small details you're talking about, yeah, there are, you know, when Marin is shoplifting in a scene, one of the things she's taking is tampons. Later when Marin and, and Lee are in a relationship, 
There are condoms on the table, if you notice. And that's a wonderful way to build story and character without necessarily having to codify it all in dialogue. Because you want your audience really looking, really listening, really paying attention. And if they miss some things because of that, to me, that's a much less, uh, less troublesome uh, idea than, than to be wasting the precious time we have um, having them speak to an audience instead of to one another, if that makes sense. It, it does. And, and I love that. And I also wanted to talk about the way in which you've crafted the, a lot of the supporting characters in this movie, because there's elements genre wise, you know, obviously it goes into the horror genre, it goes into romance, but then it also goes into a road movie element where, um, you know, you have these characters come in for these fleeting moments, but you really need them to exist more than just the tool of building a certain narrative arc within a scene. And it absolutely does that in this film. You know, when Mark Rylance's film, Sully first came on screen I was like I would watch an entire spinoff and yeah. entire film following this character it's brilliant and you feel that way yeah. about all of them um and you've mentioned that one of the things for you is that the same way that when an actor is preparing to play one of those roles they're really building out their entire world you know who were they before how do they exist in their day to day so that they come in fully formed and that, that it sounds like that's really how you approach it in the writing process as well and so what what is the time that you spend with these characters or the details that you really want to build out for yourself so that they feel that way when they come on screen. Sure. I mean, to me, again, dialogue ends up being the, the index for whether or not that work is happening. And so um, I'll take, for example, Brad and Jake, who I would love to write a television, an ongoing television show about. I find them so, <laughs> so interesting. I, they're not characters in the book. I, I, I included them because I liked very much the idea to help get more at this vegan subtext that there might be a character who is eating people in this film who actually isn't an eater. Um, Michael Stolbog calls David Gordon Green's character a groupie. And I thought just even offering the film, the world of the film, a character who's doing this out of a kind of fetishistic desire rather than a, a need would really start to alienate characters like Marin. I mean, she has so much self-loathing about what she has to do. The idea that someone would choose to do it is you know, is, is horrifying to her and should be to the audience as well. And so in deciding how to present a character like that, um, I guess I could have had someone walk in with a little soliloquy about I'm choosing to do it and it fills me with power. And, you know, but to me, it seemed much more interesting um, to use that character as one more opportunity for a kind of naturalistic glimpse into the wider world of these eaters um, where, they're, they are making references to things that we'll never know about. They, are, they have in-jokes that we're not really necessarily invited into. You can tell there's a very specific dynamic between them. I don't think that relationship is going to last very long <laughs> because of the way that, that Brad is so triggered by Jake most of the time. Um, Jake doesn't seem very interested in being uh, as discreet about the other about David Gordon Green's character's world is he might have promised at first. You get all these little hints of things that are just up observed midstream. You get a frame around what you're seeing, um, but you sense that they're referring to all kinds of things, stories, anecdotes, history they have together that you'll never have access to. And to me, that is one of the hallmarks of any road trip I've ever been on is you meet people very briefly. Um, they say very specific things about themselves and their lives, half of which you don't understand because you don't have the wider context. But we still, you know, in those constellations of details that we don't understand, we build our own sense of who they are. Maybe that isn't entirely a correct sense of who they are, but it's a strong one because we're only using what we're being given. So that's, you know, when you try to construct characters like that, it's a lot of fun actually to, to realize how much of what we think we need to know about a character you can take away and replace with just a handful of very specific earnest details. Definitely. And you also bring up a great point with Marin there about you know, her, her resentment towards herself and the way that she sees herself through these actions, you know, which we also even see through the lens of, of how she sees Sully in the house when he, he shows her the woman who's laying on the floor. Um, and yet it feels like there's a real evolution in the relationship that she has with herself in that regard over time where she starts to understand, you know, this is, this is something that 
is just part of me for survival. You know, I, I didn't choose this, but it is part of who I am. And she comes to accept herself in a different way by the end of the film. And so how did you want to graduate that journey of, of what are the different experiences and people that she meets and ways in which she starts to accept herself and see herself very differently? Yeah, to me, I think the key line in that, in that process for her, in that journey for her, is after they've committed a, a murder that has um, clearer consequences for the deceased than they might have expected. So it's when they discover that a man they've killed, whom they assumed was single and, and probably um, not the most careful person in the world, they've they've just they've chosen him or leah in ways has chosen him for those reasons but then they realize he's in the closet he's married he has children uh and that changes the polarity of the experience entirely and so in that argument afterwards lee is trying to justify what they've done and Marin just says look i'm not talking about that i know we have to do this but i'm talking about being a friend to yourself you know we're going to have to do this for 60 70 more years and if you aren't a friend to yourself uh, or find a way to be a friend to yourself. It's it, it it can't it can't possibly work. And and not only is that a difference between Marin and other characters in in the film who have never probably thought of it that way. I mean, I think I understand what she means when she says it. I certainly intuitively put that line in her in her mouth. It's this idea that yes, she's going to be an agent of destruction and violence in her life. But there if there aren't if there isn't some system of deciding that certain ways of doing it are better than others, certain people are better better than others to do it with or do it to, that there have to, and there have to be emotions about it. You can't pretend that it's not happening. You have to be in contact with um, what you're putting out in the world and what you're taking from the world. And if you can do that in a way that seems the, the best of many versions of it, maybe friendship with yourself is a possibility. And it just, I find that a very important moment in any, any young person's maturation is this idea that no, there is no perfect version of this. And there is no getting out of living one's life without there being consequence to it, to other people. But if you're mindful about it and as soulful about it as possible, you may actually have the integrity of self-respect, which is something none of these characters seem to know very much about. Yeah. And, and also within that, that speaks to the relationship between Marin and Lee, which at the beginning, it starts off as her just having gone through this initial discovery of I'm not the only person in the world like this, having met Sully and now meeting Lee for it for the second person that she's discovered. And, you know, it kind of, again, feels like they both have to be going on these individual journeys to find each other and come together in the way that they do, because it's not a given between them at the beginning. It's a convenience. Um, and so how did you find the pacing of when does it feel like the right moment to create these shifts and to really create more of a genuine intimacy versus, you know, in essence, just a real guttural need for one another in a certain way? Yeah, I think the, the scene for me that, that really illustrates what you're talking about is, is on the hilltop in Nebraska when Marin knows enough about what happened to, to Lee's father, which is the, it is the fun, foundational trauma of Lee's life, which he's never been willing to discuss with her. And she finds out enough about it, and it feels like the right moment in their relationship because I think they really do finally come together and see one another without judgment, only with love that she doesn't uh, take his deflection uh, for, for an answer anymore. When she asks about him and he says, I don't wanna talk about this stuff. I don't sweat it out like you do, I think is the phrase he uses. She pushes him and no one I think has ever pushed him before. And, and it's this very, I think, very tender scene between a person who's saying you can trust me and I'm about to prove why slowly coaxing that person to, to re release the hardest possible thing you know, that person has in his psyche to release to someone else. And so I think I knew that would be the pivotal point. So building an arc between them where you could see that some respect and credit and trust was being earned, then lost, then re-earned. Uh, and finally, Marin understanding that there's a, there, there is a way in which he will never answer these questions if I ask them in a certain polite way, that I'm actually going to have to take his hand and pull him into this with me. And I just, you know, their chemistry, obviously, Timmy and Taylor are uh, exceptional actors, uh, and their chemistry is what allows you to believe in that scene. Um, but in terms of writing the scene, it just felt like uh, waiting, earning the moment when one lover can make that kind of demand of the other lover. 
and feel like it is it is an act of love instead of an act of protection on what on her part and one of the other scenes that that feels like it must have required a lot of delicacy in the crafting um, and touching upon spoiler territory a little bit is when Marin eventually meets her mother, played by Chloe Sevigny. And that is a real space that we cr- cross over into the genre space quite heavily in terms of her mother's experience, finding out that her mom also was afflicted with this as well. That's where it comes from genetically within her, probably. Um, but also at the same time, this is this is you know, going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, a young girl turning into a woman. And that's such a pivotal moment in, you know, everything that she's hoped and imagined and wanted from this relationship and finally finding her. And then everything that she finds once she opens that door. And so what was a lot of the the delicacy or nuance that a scene like that required because it's such a pivotal shift for Marin. Yeah, that's a scene I talked uh, a lot about with, with, with some of the, some of my women friends about their relationships with their mother and the nature of that betrayal and and just the 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 idea that you know that you could be in that scene you could be you could and this is a rule of mine for every character but particularly characters that are that have this that are deployed in this kind of genre way um, that that one can still have empathy with a character like Marin's mom and if you can sort of read between the lines what she's doing or what she thinks she's doing is quite heroic, but it's predicated on this belief that the film doesn't agree with, and I hope the audience doesn't agree with, which is that the world of of love wants no monsters in it. And so Marin has, it's a lot Marin has to, has to come to terms with in that scene. One is that she had a mother who really wanted a daughter, then was sort of driven out of the family by a father who was concerned, rightfully concerned about her safety and went and put herself realizing or coming to the conclusion that, you know, women, especially women who have to make life, but also in her case and Marin's case, take life, that it's too much. And that the the expectation of love or understanding or even self-acceptance is well beyond what's possible. So what you get is a room with bars in it and a door that locks and that's, or suicide essentially is what her mother's, her mother's letter is about. And her mother has in fact waited 15 years in K or 18 years in case there was this moment when her daughter found out where she was because her father told told her about the fact that her mother was also cannibal and is waiting there to kill her i mean it's just it's such a a failure of empathy and a failure of love and a failure of self-respect on her mother's part but understandably one hopefully by this point in the movie can understand why someone might take that approach but I just think we're so relieved when Marin comes out of that meeting with her mother and says, I'm not going to be like, that. I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to see my options that way. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it was a very delicate scene to write. And as soon as we started shooting it, you know, I thought, oh no, have, uh, have we turned the horror grammar up too high, you know, with screaming people in the corridors and, and, um, but it was the right move because I think the audience needed to discharge a lot of that tension that had been building up by that point. Um, so it, now I find it, both moving, but also that's the, that is the biggest jump scare in the film. <laughs> when I look at the audience, when they see that scene, that's the one where everybody sort of loses it for a moment because they're just not expecting. I can imagine that, that must be a fun one to turn around and look at everybody. <laughs> oh, I wish I had infrared goggles so I could just simply sit and watch the audience the entire time. But that, that one, that's a moment where everybody's so riveted to the screen that you can sneak a look around and <laughs> without seeming and- creepy. <laughs> And and lastly, you know, one one of the things about writing is that every single project is is taking you outside of your comfort zone in different ways. And and I, I've heard you say that that's actually one of the aspects that you really love and enjoy. And for a movie like this that brings in so many different types of language, so many styles, so many genres, and just the delicacy of really interweaving that into something that lands in such an emotional and character driven space, how did you feel like this really pulled you outside of your comfort zone in a lot of ways? Well, I mean, so many ways that I, you know, I, I wrote a number of horror movies early in my career that, that some of them were pretty terrible. They'd been rewritten by other people. And, you know, I, I, I have, I have this idea of how horror works, but it's taken me like a decade to, to actually convince anyone else that, that, that my, my version of it actually might be, might be saleable or marketable because it's not, I don't love jump scares. I don't love brutalizing an audience. Um, I love character driven stories, even horror stories. And, and so with this film, I mean, uh, what, a, what a pleasure and an honor to be able to, to take on a subject like this. 
or a story like this with these particular collaborators. To me, these the collaborators are the insurance against someone dismissing this film. I mean, you could watch a trailer and if it didn't have Timmy and Mark Rylance and Chloe, you know, and Taylor and actors you think of as having a great deal of integrity, if they weren't in this film and Luca weren't directing the film, even the best version of the script might really miss its audience, its chance at an audience. But because these collaborators are so interesting, um, I think it's impossible not to imagine, oh, there's something more to this than just a can't, some kind of cannibal horror movie. So I really credit my collaborators as being the reason why I think this can somehow sort of slip through and reach people in a, in a more literary way. But I didn't have that assurance when I was writing the script, of course. So I, all I could do was make the assumption we have to make, which is if I do my work very well, um, maybe it will attract the good intentions of, of, of people at a, at a higher level than myself. <laughs> and, you know, my, my New Year's resolution every year is I want to be the dumbest person in every conversation I'm in. And, and you know, when you work on projects like this, you actually are, <laughs> which is the most exciting thing. <laughs> I was like, I, we I weirdly love that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's done me really well, I have to say. I just want to work, I, I winnowed it down to my friends laugh at me because I say this all the time. I want to work on projects uh, that scare me with people that don't. And if I can just do that one thing over and over again in my career, I'll, I'll be I'll be so happy. And this was well, an example of that. Well, I hope that your your career is a continued space of doing things that scare you with people that don't. Um, it's such a beautiful film and I really, really loved it. So thank, thank you so you. much, Dave. I really thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you. And those questions, it was lovely to answer those questions. Thank you for them. <laughs>